started then. So this is an interview with Dylan uh, Myslowick, pronounced correctly, a wee yeah. bit of practice. And we're going to be talking about, I've kind of changed it about, I told people on Ben's Business Book Club it will be about marketing and psychology of persuasion, but I've decided we're going to be talking about, and I defined it with more clarity, rewiring your mind for success, which is exactly what myself and Dylan have managed to do over years of pushing ourselves through reading and personal development to turn our lives around. And we've got a very similar journey. So I found uh, Dylan's journey very fascinating. We're both into digital marketing. So we ne- we know each other through Instagram. We connected. Yeah. And yeah, there, I, I, I post a lot of stories over there. And we, we're always commenting back and forward on each other's stories and post on social media, probably about books. And that's how we ended up connecting just by being very aligned with each other, having the same goals and going in the same direction. You've also like been on the rise, just coming from a, a, a job you didn't like to to actually take action and, and to start to the process of leaving your work. But what actually happened was uh, through the restructure, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, through restructuring and reading and studying the, the the books, you maybe became uninterested in the job that you're actually in, and you were fired anyway. So you went into and take, took the plunge and the jump into entrepreneurship and started structuring your own life and starting your business and your ventures that you're into now. So it'd be interesting to hear how you're creating a life for yourself, a more meaningful one on your terms. And one one th- thing I wanted to add as well about how, how this podcast came together is you asked I, I posted a question up to Ben's Business Book Club to ask, if anyone had any questions about something, and I, I went to contact you to give you some advice on that, and then I realized that you knew quite a lot, and I knew you'd been studying. It was just interesting to, to hear your replies, because I knew you knew something. <laughs> and then you, it, it, the tables turned, and Dylan ended up starting teaching me a bunch of things I never knew, and we had a really interesting conversation. So I was like, let's do a Facebook Live on Ben's Business Podcast this Wednesday, and here we are. So... Do you want to give another introduction and uh, go into the... I've hopefully given you a good enough introduction, but you can go into that a wee bit further and touch on parts I've maybe missed that I don't know about you. But the, the one thing that I really find interesting and fascinating is the story on how you started to turn your life around. And it reminds me of my own story. But you mentioned that uh, you've lost a lot of weight. If you can give us the exact like details of what you actually done to do that, because I'm sure there's other people have similar goals. And on top of that, you, you'd racked up some debt or whatever. And thing, things like that, just simple issues that we get ourselves in. And people have reached rock bottom, how they can turn their life around, how you've done it. And yeah, tell us a story around that and how all that came together. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically, about, I want to say three and a half years ago now, uh, I ended up you know, at a job where I, I kept trying to make changes. Uh, I, I showed up every day with a uh, button up, a tie, slacks and dress shoes. Cause I was like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make it big. I'm going to move up the ladder. And uh, basically every, every step of the way, if I came up with an idea that if I discovered would save the company money, I would, I would get shut down here and there. And uh, it, it got demoralizing after a while. And so one day I'm on YouTube as uh, most hardworking employees are. And uh, essentially what ended up happening was I wasn't allowed to have Google Chrome, so I couldn't have ad blocker. And one day I get that, uh, that ad that most people who don't have ad blocker have seen. Hey, I'm here in my garage from uh, Ty Lopez. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I'll admit uh, he's a bit salesy, but uh, his, his pitch on reading was very uh, persuasive. And so every, every position I got sat in the office, I was always not facing anyone because I was never on a team. I got hired as a, a contractor. And once I finally got uh, into the final seat I'd get in before actually becoming a full-time employee, I sat across from somebody who like was over a cubicle wall. And essentially, I just started chatting with him. And it turns out he was very antisocial. And it seems that I, I attract those people because even though I'm very <laughs> extroverted, uh, most of my best friends are actually antisocial. So it's uh, quite humorous that he ended up sitting right there. So I ended up chatting with him about, you know, this guy I keep seeing in these ads. 
and how I keep, uh, you know, hearing about, you know, how reading changed his life. And I started talking with him and it turns out he actually is, you know, at least was at one point a very avid reader. And he actually, I think, went to school for maybe mechanical engineering, but he ended up as a nuclear engineer and then an electrical engineer and, and even a programmer. And so I was like, that's crazy. Like he taught himself a lot of these, um, these other skills. And so after a little while, he ended up telling me, he's like, I have this whole collection of digital books and I think I have a couple audio books. I'm like, I don't think I, I can't stand those, you know, e-readers, but I'll give the audio book a try. And so he ended up having two of the best self-help books uh, I've ever read. And they, I got them like right when I needed them. And the first one was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And before he even begins to dive into the habits, he explains how essentially you need to learn to accept new things like this. And the way that uh, we go through change when we, we believe one thing, but we need to believe a, another in order to succeed is we have what's called a paradigm shift. And I'm literally on my way to work about a year after, a year and a half maybe after starting my job. And all of a sudden, like as he's discussing what an aha moment is, which is an instantaneous paradigm shift where everything you once believed switches to something else. And I literally on my way to work, I remember that happening. And I, I was just blown away. I'm like, holy crap, like this is what's been in books. Like I, I haven't been... <laughs> I, I had never read any full length book in my entire life. I used to forge my dad's signature on those, uh, on those must reads for elementary and middle school. Uh, when I finally got to high school, I never did the summer reading. Uh, I was good enough in math and science. I didn't need to do well in English. I, I, I outweighed that with my, uh, my other academics. And so I never really got into reading. Uh, I still remember there was one book we read in high school called East of Eden, and there was only one chapter we didn't read in class, and we were supposed to read at home. So technically, that would have been the first book I finished, but I didn't read that chapter at home. <laughs> so so yeah. I, I, I just couldn't get through books. But at that moment, as I'm listening to it on the ride home, or on the ride to work, I just was like, holy crap. And so I ended up finishing that, that audio book in about two weeks and I immediately popped in the other one and another great classic, it was How to Win Friends and Influence People. And even though I, I've always been very um, you know, conversationalist, I, I've always been able to converse with anybody, it doesn't matter where they come from or what they, they like, I always have something to talk about. One of the big things uh, that I realized though was there were certain ways that I was communicating that were off-putting. And so I, I slowly started adjusting those and ironically, the more I adjusted those, I actually became uh, more friendly with other people in the office as well as just people I was networking with and meeting in general. And so I, after I finish, or I'm halfway through that second audio book and I'm like, you know what, I'll, I'll take the dive. I'll start, I'll start getting into reading. And I remember picking up uh, four books from Amazon. It's the first time I ever put money down on books that I cared about other than being forced to buy books in college. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, the first four books I got, I believe, were, um, what was it? Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker. It was a 54-page book. I'm like, can't hurt. I'm sure that'll be easy to get through. Uh, and then I got Confessions of an Advertising Man by uh, David Ogilvy and uh, Tested Advertising, which I actually never even got through that entirely, so I don't remember the author's name. <laughs> And then the fourth book I got was Sam Walton's Made in America, which I actually keep up on a shelf over my uh, desk as uh, motivation. Yeah, but, uh, it's a great book. Yeah, so basically what ended up happening was I, I read Managing Oneself, and, I, and it talks about how people learn differently and how you should learn how you learn. And one of the big things I realized was at one point, reading wasn't my thing. I did not gain any extra knowledge from reading. And so that was the biggest thing that, the biggest fault that I had in school was that people were trying to teach me through reading and that's not how I, I learned. I learned through uh, actually being interactive in the class. Like that's the reason why I, I killed it in math class. They would start drawing something on the board and I'd answer the question before she asked it and I'd get kicked out of class. Like just go on to the halls, you know, like, you know, until, until I finish with this. So yeah. that, that, that's always how I was until, like I said, I, I realized what I could actually gain from books, like what knowledge there was available. And so uh, that was how my initial reading journey began uh, with those four books. And like I said, one of them I didn't even finish, so I, but I did finish the first three. And now I've finished over, I think, 75 books in the last three years. Uh, yeah. And based on, I think, like the, 
national statistic, uh, the average person reads one book a year. So I'm doing pretty good for myself and uh, up to, I guess, most 75 year olds. Yeah. Yeah. And essentially the other big thing that happened too, and probably the one thing that made me susceptible to wanting to learn something new was um, coincidentally, my, uh, my aunt likes to take a lot of pictures at family events. And what ended up happening one day was she got me at a, uh, it was a pool party for, I believe it was somebody's graduation. I still know the picture because I still have it today. I think it's even in my Instagram feed uh, where basically I just, I, I was not happy with the way I looked. And not only that, she got me while I had like a bowl of jello in my hand with like Cool Whip on the top of it. And I'm like that, that is not something I want, I want to be showboating anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So what, what ended up happening was I, I saw that and I immediately started, um, you know, I, I started uh, looking into, you know, the best ways to lose weight. And it actually turns out that one of the, the best habits to form in order to lose weight is not, you know, making sure you go to the gym every day. It's not just eating healthy. It's simply recording what you eat. And by doing so, you, you mentally tell yourself like, wow, this is what I'm doing to myself. And that, yeah. that was a big, you know, blow to the, you know, the head is like, holy crap, like, that this is what I've been consuming. I've been consuming twice the daily recommendations, even for myself, uh, you know, since, you know, the daily recommendations, like 2000 on average, but per person, it's different. And even for someone, uh, you know, my age, height, weight, uh, I think I can consume 26 to 2800 calories. And I was well beyond that. And that was aside from the fact that I wasn't exercising, I hadn't done sports in years, I hadn't uh, been hitting the gym, I hadn't been running, I hadn't been biking. And so I first started off by just simply, you know, recording what I was eating. And uh, the way that I kept track of it, there was an app, uh, it was once called Lyft, and now it's called Coach.me. And essentially, you can, it's just a habit tracker. It's like, did I do this today? Swipe, right? And yeah. every day that you do it, it'll give you, you know, it'll be like, oh, you're on a five day streak, right? And so that was my goal was to just not break that streak. So I, I had this other way that motivated me to keep track of what I was eating. And so it wasn't just like, oh, I got to do it. It's like, oh, I get to hit the swipe, right? And yeah. unbeknownst to myself, I was creating the reward for my habit loop. And by doing yeah. that, I, I just continually got reinforced and to the point where I was enjoying writing it down, even when I forgot to check it mm -hmm. off. Yeah. And could I add? Could I add a couple of lessons for yeah. the the, you, the viewers and the listeners? It's the, it's the same like when we're thinking about business because the podcast is about business as well. But we're wanting to use this story as well as like a way to get lessons. So like if you record what you're eating every day, the same happens when you do that when you record what you're doing in business every day and see why you're not successful yet. Uh, so oh, it's yeah. the same idea and the same habits almost are exactly the same in every area of life. You just have to bring that lesson over into business and every other area of your life. And I just wanted to add that on that recording what you eat is very similar to recording what you're actually doing on your timetable and your daily activities. Yeah, a very, very uh, coincidental uh, thing that I did was uh, about, I'll say probably about three years ago, I actually ended up also trying to figure out like, oh, how can I get more reading and how can I get more learning in? Because that was one of the things, again, that that Ty Lopez guy is like, oh, yeah, you, you know, people say they have they don't have any time. And I was like, well, where is my time? I was curious, like, where was I actually spending my time? So I downloaded an app. It's called uh, A Time Logger 2, I think. And essentially, uh, every single day, I record exactly what I do. It's like, oh, I, I, I wait. So I record when I sleep. When I wake up, it's like I have a getting ready, you know, uh, option. And basically, you, you can create as many things as you want and uh, specify it or, you know, broaden it however you'd like. But I essentially summed it up to like, this is when I was at work, this is when I was on break, this mm -hmm. is when I was eating lunch, etc. And I realized that at one point, I was like, holy crap, I'm playing like hours and hours of video games, <laughs> just a day, let alone in a week or a month. And I was like, there's one thing I can cut back, like, I don't even have to remove it, I can just cut it back. Uh, you know, if I just removed one hour of that every day, I'd have an hour to read or I have an hour to, uh, you know, work on uh, just myself with, you know, taking online courses, whatever it was. And so I ended up uh, seeing that and ultimately started changing that. So it's, it's very interesting because I have an entire record of almost everything I've done for the last three years uh, in well, this app. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> and so, and, you know, and obviously like if I went on something like vacation, I would just hit vacation and I wouldn't, I wouldn't track it. It was that it was the download time. It was time to relax. Right. But uh, it was very interesting to start seeing that, oh, like if I just, if I just do a little here, a little there, I can start adding more. And one of the big things I did was uh, I added, um, I added reading to every one of the breaks I had at work. So while I'm at work, I, I get one 10 minute break in the morning, one 10 minute break in the afternoon, and then I get a 45 minute lunch break. I'm like, I can eat lunch in 15 minutes. So there's a half hour section of reading. And so every day I automatically, I was going to get, you know, roughly 50 minutes of reading. And because I slowly stopped like in my job, I got 55 minutes an hour, maybe an hour, 10 minutes, yes. uh, just cause I would slowly just be sneaking in, um, some more reading. And uh, or just overlapping the time that I, I should get back to work. And yeah. so, so that was that was a big thing was just simply tracking what I was doing. So I was aware because most of the reason people fall into these bad habit loops is because they're unaware of what they're actually doing. And the second you become aware of it, it's very powerful for what you can do. Uh, I think I, I mentioned you on our on our phone call, like something simple I did just to test if I could break certain habits was adjusting the way I write the letter A. Like instead of the, the standard oh, yeah. like circle and line, I'm like, let me try to do the, uh, the curled top in the circle. And after about a month and a half, now it's like, I've been doing that since I was five years old. And now I, for, I, I forget that when I want to write it the other way, I actually have to think about it because I erased mm -hmm. that habit. And yeah. because you write all the time, if you actually, well, not everyone writes, but I write a lot. And because of that, it, it was so impactful that like, it almost erased something I, I knew since I was five. That's like, pr like pretend erasing learning how to ride a bike. Like that's yeah. powerful, like what you can do with your brain. And mm -hmm. one, one of the big things I learned through a lot of research, not through books necessarily, although I do have a book I need to get to, is that our brains are plastic. Uh, it was once thought like, oh, if you have a drink, you're killing brain cells and uh, neurons don't grow back. But it turns out your brain, as long as it's utilized, actually can grow back uh, very rapidly and you can even alter how your brain is shaped. You can make it so that there's more connections one way than another and remove connections to bad things. And that's how you get, uh, you know, habit loops to begin with is you get a, a set of patterns that are created in your brain to make something easier to do. And so that's how you create the habit. It's not necessarily that you want to do it. It's the fact that it's the least amount of energy your brain can use will do the thing that's easiest. And the easiest thing usually ends up being something bad unless you control it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So after, after I started that, that weight loss journey and then all of a sudden I, you know, I started picking up books along the way and now I'm, I'm, I'm losing weight and I'm starting to read. Uh, all of a sudden I realized like, wow, I, I'm definitely, I'm not a fan of working for somebody else. Like the fact that if I have a good idea, the only thing that's stopping me is someone just saying no. I was like, I'm, I'm not okay with that. Yeah. And uh, so basically I decided from that point, I'm like, I'm definitely never going to work for someone else again. I'm going to stay at this job. I'm going to, cause I have debt. I can't just quit. One, one of my biggest things. And the only reason I didn't quit was I was one of, uh, I'm one of five uh, siblings. And if I had quit, I would be, I, I, or when I was employed, I was the only one that had a steady income. So Okay. Uh, one thing I wanted to make sure was that if, if they ever needed anything, they could just come to me because I could help them out. You know, I yeah. was working as an engineer. I made plenty of money. I didn't need to worry about, um, you know, finances. I still had debt, but you know, I was paying it off, uh, at a relatively quick rate. I didn't need to, I didn't need, didn't need to worry about that. And so what ended up happening was while I started, uh, you know, uh, basically, delineating, de delineating away from work, uh, and focusing more on basically myself. Uh, I slowly, I slowly also showed signs of that to some people at work, but apparently not to everyone, because at one point I even actually got promoted during this, uh, this little, uh, movement, uh, of mine. Yeah. And so al along this whole journey, I, 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 one of the big things I took up after reading was I took up online courses and I started uh, just teaching myself random stuff like programming, web design. And I knew a little bit about web design, but I wasn't sufficient enough that I could comfortably go to someone and be like, yeah, that'll be $1,200 for a website. I'd be like, I really hope I can build this website, let alone you paying me for it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, 
So th then I ended up coming across probably one of the most uh, impactful and powerful books for productivity, which is called The One Thing, which I know you're doing the 66 day challenge from. Yeah. And day, day 10 of getting up at 4.45. <laughs> very nice. I got to day 10. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, cons I consider myself as an insomniac, so that's pretty good going. <laughs> and the 66 day challenge works, yeah. And uh, so that was one of the things is that uh, when I first got through that book, I, I didn't think about, you know, doing like the 66 day challenge or anything like that. But I was I, I really did ask the question, the focusing question, which is uh, what is the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will become easier or unnecessary to achieving my goal. And so there's a there's a whole um, packet that you can print out right off their website. And it's the goal setting to the now. And so I, I started with my someday goal, which was like, I want absolute financial freedom. I want it to the point where I can wake up, do nothing and go to sleep and make enough money to have everything that I want. Not so that I can just veg out, but the, the main reason I wanted to do it was actually so that I could then do other things like start another business, you know, help my family, help a charity, do whatever I want to actually work on by having freedom of time. And yeah. so... Uh, I slowly started building skills that I knew eventually could convert into something like passive income. So uh, creating a social media marketing uh, company, by, by doing that, I could end up, you know, getting clients. And once I get them completely uh, in a system, I can then take someone else and be like, all right, you handle their website, you handle their Facebook ads, and I'll just be the overwatcher. And, you know, I, I learned a few other things that I could uh, get into at a different time. But basically, I learned a lot of uh, various uh, ways that you can make recurring revenue without having to put in a lot of um, active time. And so one of the, uh, one of the things I, I really got from that book was like focus on one thing. And what ended up happening was February of 2017. Uh, so rewind about, I think it was September of 2015. I started picking up martial arts and uh, that definitely was a huge impact on my life. It was like a combination of uh, working out as well as um, basically uh, a stress reliever, a mm -hmm. uh, focusing almost meditative practice because you have to be very focused to do a lot of the things that we work on. Uh, I, I take uh, Jeet Kune Do for anybody out there that's curious. Um, it's, very, it's very much like an MMA style fighting. You, you, you fight on various realms. It's not like just grappling. It's not just striking like boxing, right? So uh, it helped a lot with just focus and all of that. And what ended up happening was I'm sparring with my, uh, my uke or my uh, sparring partner. And he ends up tossing me and me being uh, myself, I'm like, oh, I'm going to try to reverse it even though I'm the one in the air right now. I end up taking him and toppling us both on top of my shoulder. And what ended up happening was uh, I, I immediately, like, I'm like, yep, tap. Like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much... Uh, I, I'm not like, accustomed to pain, but it, 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 I don't react how most people do. I usually laugh it off no matter how bad it is. And it, immediately I was laying on the ground. I'm like, oh, this is going to hurt tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and so I go, I go to sit up and I realize my arm didn't really come with me. It kind of like just hung there. And I'm like, yeah. oh, this, oh. Is, this is not going to be, uh, this is not going to be good. And uh, as I, as I end up, uh, you know, trying to stand up, I realize like this thing is just going to keep sliding. This thing hurts like hell. Uh, luckily, it was the winter, so I had my sweatshirt there. I made probably one of the most comfortable uh, slings I've ever had. Even the one the doctor gave me wasn't as comfortable as this. But I sling my arm up, and uh, basically, my, uh, I think my Sifu ended up driving me home. He's just like, or, oh, no, it was one of my classmates ended up driving me home because they're like, we're not, we're not going to let you drive home. Like, that's, that looks like it hurts. <laughs> so what ends up happening is I get home. Uh, first off, they were going to bring me to the hospital. I'm like, I'm not paying ER bills to go for a popped out shoulder. It's probably just a dislocated shoulder. So I get home and I Google videos of how to pop my shoulder back in and I'll, I'll go to get an x-ray tomorrow morning at like urgent care or something like that. And so I look him up. I, I have my cousin here and he, uh, he basically helps me repositions it and I, I feel it. I feel it pop right in and it instantly mm -hmm. I feel great. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Like I thought this was gonna be terrible. And so I raise my arms up. I'm like, yes, perfect. And the second I let go of my shoulder muscle, I just fell to my knees with pain. It was one of the most excru I felt like someone yeah. just stabbed me in the shoulder. Yeah. Um, what I would later find out is not only did I dislocate my shoulder, I also separated my AC joint and I fractured my um, clavicle. And so uh, basically I was, 
out of commission for like three to four months, uh, no martial arts, which yeah. I do six hours a week. And so right. it yeah. basically, and, and, and that's on, that's a low estimate. It, it was actually usually more because on Friday nights we would, we'd go for a couple extra hours, but essentially, you know, I, I'm like, what, what do I do with this extra time? And I just finished the one thing. It was the most odd, odd scenario that I happened to have finished that book right there. And so what I ended up doing was I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what it is the one thing I should do. And after breaking it all down, I realized one of the ways I can make recurring revenue was creating WordPress templates. So I'm like, all right, well, then I need to become a WordPress developer. I got to take my skills and bring it to this table. Yeah. So I end up uh, taking this online course. I think it's 28 and a half hours, which is the equivalent of a single semester of classes or a little bit more in uh, – in a, like an actual school. And mm -hmm. this particular course was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, if anyone's curious, I can, I can send a link to it. <laughs> but uh, I, I ended up plowing through it in like a month, maybe a month and a half. And then all of a sudden I went from like, you know, I, I, I knew how to do web design pretty good now up to the point where like, wow, I, I'm a professional WordPress developer. Like I know yeah. how to do everything on the back end of WordPress now. And that, that immediately opened up a bunch, uh, many opportunities like that one skill alone. Uh, I've been able to make, I think now six or seven. Yeah. I think six or seven WordPress sites, you know, getting me a few thousand dollars just for this one skill. And that, and that yeah. was undercharging what I could have like a, a normal WordPress developer for a single site can charge like minimum, like $2,000. And I was being nice. Cause I'm like, I, I want to get clients. I want to help people out. A lot of the times I was helping friends out as well. So I would cut it back by a lot. And so, you know, but basically that's what I got from that three months is I just started focusing. I started taking more online courses. I got better at graphic design, better at logo design. I started getting more clients and mm -hmm. uh, eventually my shoulder heals up. I get back to martial arts, you know, so I lose that, those, um, well, my shoulder heals up. It's, it's still, uh, you know, still got a nice little lump right here. That'll probably never go away. All but right. uh, but uh, essentially, <laughs> I'm capable of moving again. And after all that, so I, I lose my six hours of you know study time, but I slowly, um, you know, just start increasing my reading time. And uh, finally, yeah. I start getting through books uh, that you know I got a lot of business books at first, like oh you should read this one, like zero to one. But I'm like it was a great book, but it's not helping me now. I'm not creating the next big app. I'm not creating. Uh, I'm not inventing something new. Uh, so a lot of it wasn't uh, highly applicable to me until I started eventually getting into uh, psychology books. And that was one of the biggest impacts I could have had. Uh, essentially, w instead of, instead of um, going into, you know, how can I specifically make a business better? It's like, what, what's like the mindset, you know, that you need to have for yourself in order to even run a business? What's the mindset of your customers that you're trying to help to begin with? Uh, you know, yeah. eventually I, I want to get into business consulting and I, I've actually done a little bit of that already, but, uh, not to an, not to the extent that I'd wish. Um, but with that business consulting, I, I don't go in and basically go, Oh, you're, you're running your business wrong. You know, I try to, I try to connect with them and figure out why they even think their business should be run that way. And yeah. so d definitely of all the books that I've read, uh, I've, I've read from, you know, standard self-help to, you know, productivity to, uh, general knowledge, like some book like Freakonomics, although, uh, to be honest, that also kind of delves a little into psychology and how to think differently. Um, yeah. You know, I've been into business, marketing, advertising, uh, philosophy, and of all of those books, um, the biggest one, or the ones that have had the biggest impact on me have been the psychology books, purely yeah. because uh, now I understand, like, when someone gets mad at me, I'm not like, why are they mad at me? Instead, I'm like, oh, I can connect the dots but I don't get mad anymore uh, to, yeah. to the point where like, don't get me wrong, everyone gets mad. So I still get, I still get mad. I'll get mad on like Rocket League if someone's kicking my ass or something like that, but not yeah, to the extent yeah. that a lot of people still do where they get frustrated because somebody Reactive. left a shoe in the hallway. Yeah, exactly. Where it's like, oh, yeah. you know, somebody messed up something I wasn't used to. I'm mad, right? Change. And so yeah. that, that's a big thing that I see a lot of people fall prey to. And after changing that mindset, uh, the best thing that happened wasn't actually just to me, but it was to my environment. And not because I had a different outlook and I'm looking through rose, uh, you know, rose colored glasses or whatever the saying is, it's because I noticed that people around me actually started to change. People were more, more open to me, people would start, um, you know, telling me more things uh, about what they're doing. I actually ended up getting 
uh, two or three clients from work because I was just, they just wanted to converse with me. And so while at, like, so like one thing uh, for anybody who is currently working a day job and they're trying to get out to do their own side business, the one thing I recommend is don't just quit, like build yourself up the whole time. It's okay to go <laughs> slow because like eventually sometimes you need the push. Like for me, I, I'm, I definitely get to the point where I felt like I was beyond ready and I'm just like, oh, I just need to pay off my debt first. Like that's what I need to do. But I'm, I'm, I knew I was lying to myself. Uh, and I'm glad that somebody else got to push me because it felt a lot better mm -hmm. and I got paid for that push. So, yeah. uh, you know, but one of the big things that, um, like I said, the people changing around me that really happened was I even noticed family members changing around me. Uh, one of the biggest examples I noticed was like my dad. I know that he always meant good things. Uh, you know, he always had good intentions for me, but, you know, obviously we, we, we'd fight. Uh, but sometimes I feel like the fights were much, much more, than they needed to be. They're very unnecessary for the lesson he was actually trying to teach. And over the last few years, uh, you know, even my brothers have noticed this like much calmer demeanor, much more relaxed. And I know that also comes a bit with age, but it was like such a, such a, um, a, a noticeable swing in the last few years, even though um, there's been other events that could have caused that swing before and it didn't. And, you know, then yeah. I, I notice, uh, you know, one day, uh, my, you know, my mom even asked me, I think everyone was like fighting during Christmas because, you know, that's what families do. <laughs> and uh, what ended up happening was she, you know, she kind of asked me, she's like, how do you do it? And I'm like, do what? It's like, how do you just not give a shit? And I'm like, it's not that I don't give a shit. It's just I realize we all die one day. And I was like, you know, like that, that was one of the most impactful things I had. Uh, one, one of the books, actually, I put it over here, was On the Shortness of Life. I don't know if that's there. Oh, Seneca, yeah. Yeah, and that, that, you know, that's a simple book. It's very short, and technically you don't even need to read all of this because I think this is like two other essays in here but, mm -hmm. um, by Seneca. But, you know, just realizing that there's no reason to get upset at things that aren't going to impact your life. Like, you know, like that shoe in the hallway. Like, yeah, like, you know, maybe you'll trip on it one day, but if you're aware that it could be there, then there's no reason to be upset about it. And you can always slowly change those habits. And if you try to force them, you won't even create the change you want. That's why uh, one of the things I actually learned recently, uh, another little psychology one was from like Invisible Influence. I think it was this one, um, where essentially, uh, oh, oh, that one combined with uh, Drive, that one I'm currently getting, uh, finishing up. But one yeah. of the big things I picked well, up was that. Jonah, Jonah, Ber uh, Berger. Jonah Berger. Yeah, he's the same author yeah. as uh, Contagious. And I found this one yeah. at a, um, I think I was I on my way to right LA. <laughs> this guy. Oh, yes. Yeah, That's I have, a yeah. very popular book. I've not read that, but I brought that up because I know that you've studied that one as well. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, no, it's a great book. Um, but it's funny because that's the whole reason I picked up Invisible Influence was I was at, uh, I was traveling to LA, I was in the Chicago airport, and they have like a bunch of really good bookstores in that particular airport. And uh, I'm walking by the same one I walked by the previous year that I took a cool picture of it for Instagram. Uh, and I think it's, uh, what was it? I used it for the background of Hooked, because uh, it's a book that talks about creating essentially addicting apps. But instead, I put a picture of uh, books behind it, because like, that's what I got addicted to. And you know, yeah. the worst thing's there's worse things to be addicted to. So I feel good about that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, essentially um, uh, it talks about the fact that if you try to motivate people th through the wrong means, you won't end up with the goal that you want. So like some people are like, Oh, is it okay to give your kids an allowance? It's like, it's okay. But one of the things that's interesting about that is that later when they're on their own, are they going to clean if they're not getting paid for it? Right. And that's mm -hmm. like something that, um, you know, got embedded in me was when I was a kid, uh, I, I didn't know what an allowance was until I was 14 years old. I, I, I didn't even realize people were getting paid by their parents. I kind of assumed that was part of the uh, working on the house is part of the you get to live here and eat food. So <laughs> that's at least what I was told. So, uh, you know, yeah. my motivation was simply just to not get yelled at at one point. And yeah. because even though I wasn't the oldest, I was uh, one of the most responsible or I was the most responsible of my five siblings. So like I'd be the one that I woke up first to wake everyone up. I made everyone's lunches. Uh, I, you know, I, I had the kitchen as the, you know, my cleaning duty, someone else had the living room, but if the living room wasn't clean, I ended up having to do it. Um, so because of that, ironically, I ended up becoming super messy later because I yeah. was like, ah, finally, I don't have to clean after somebody. And then I realized I wasn't even cleaning up after myself. So it just became yeah. a disaster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like, that's the thing is you don't want to, you don't want to motivate people to do what you want because you might win in the short run, but in the long run, you, you might not get the, uh, 
the ideal accomplishment that you were looking for. I think uh, Gary Vaynerchuk yeah. talks about that, like always telling the truth, even, when, even though it might be bad in this moment, it might even make someone hate you right now, is mm -hmm. better than lying and letting them figure out later. And he says the truth always uh, ends in the best long-term result. And yeah, I love that. I've, like, I've always said that. I've always yeah. said that the people who are brutally honest are the people we respect in the, uh, yeah. in the long run. And yeah, I just posted definitely. about that today, yeah. About <laughs> the, the, the fool who gets angry at you because you told them the truth uh, or you correct them. And uh, the, per the, wise, the wise man or woman... Uh, will love you for telling you the truth and yeah. correcting them. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a big one too. Cause th there's a difference. Like some people are, um, you know, they're, they're like, uh, what is it? The grammar Nazi. They're always chasing after you like, Oh, you, you didn't do this. And it's like, you know, that's not really relevant, but one of the biggest things you should always look for is your, uh, you know, the five friends you hang out with the most, you want them to also be some of the most honest people to the point where they're like, Hey, like, you know, at that thing we were at, you were kind of being a dick, right? Like you need, you need those reality yeah. <laughs> checks because if they don't yeah. do it, then your ego floats away from you and you have no idea yeah. what you're doing in a situation to the point where people become like almost afraid to tell you because they're like, oh, like that's yeah. just who he is. Like you can't, can't stop that. I'll get upset with yeah. you. And it's like, that, you don't that want gives that. You, sorry. Yeah. That gives you amazing as well as like learning your, your own self-awareness through, your, through yourself and your own actions, you, you have to learn it that way. And one good way to do that is journaling, but like that exterior way where people are, the five people around you are honest people. You want to get those people around you often. And my yeah. dad does a very good job of that for me. So I've got, I've got that, but I do naturally attract the people who tell me the truth um, because I don't get offended like most people. And I think people need to adapt the, the same idea that, taking the truth without getting offended, but grabbing the lessons out of it is the most important thing you can do in those situations rather than, oh, you're, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's a big one um, that I had to learn. It wasn't that my feelings would get hurt, but I was, I was, I still am to a degree, but I was very argumentative. Like if I thought I knew something and I was certain of it, you couldn't convince me otherwise. Like I was very much like, no, like I read about this. I heard about this. I looked into videos about it. Like, I know what I'm talking about. You need to do more research and here's all the information and you need to hear it all before you can talk again kind of thing. And I was very, yeah. uh, very aggressive like that. And um, mm -hmm. not, not to the point where like, I, it looked like I was angry or something. It was just like, I always wanted to make sure I'm like, no, like this is definitely right. Like you're wrong. And specifically after reading the how to win friends and influence people, I actually, yeah, it's very <laughs> I have a little note I keep to myself. I'll slide this off. I got a magnets here. Um, ironically, this actually, so it's this little, uh, little piece of paper that has all the principles from that book. Right. Yeah. And uh, it was something I found online. I think, I think it's still pretty easy to find. But uh, essentially, what happened one day was I actually had a client who, uh, it was one of those things where like, I, like I knew I was right. Like, like, I was actually correct. This guy had told me one thing and then asked for another. I think it was, uh, I was doing web design, graphic design, and uh, um, I think it was like creating stationary stuff for him. So like just all, all of that. And he ended up basically not giving me any information, which I then later learned a lot from that I should have been the one asking for this information. But he basically mm -hmm. gave me free reign to do something. I do all this okay. work. And it, uh, he basically is like, oh, that's not what I was looking for. And so what ends up happening is, I, I have to redo it a bunch of times. He ends up calling me one day or text. I think it was, he was texting me one day and I'm at work too. So I can't even do a lot of like actual work on his stuff right now. And he's trying to tell me how uh, essentially like, Oh, uh, you had, uh, you know, we were supposed to get this done in a week. You know, uh, we were supposed to do this, just do that. And honestly, I've been talking to my staff and, and even they're like, you know, we're thinking about getting somebody else. The, the thing he doesn't know is like, I literally was just at his place of business while he wasn't there because I needed pictures. He was aware that I was doing that, but he didn't know that I had just gone there. And I ended up talking to the staff and they loved me. Like they were all like, yeah, like this is awesome what you're doing. Like here's more information, et cetera. And the other big thing was, you know, the timetable. Like I had finished everything by the time he needed it for when he gave it to me. So for example, it was like, oh, how quick do you think you can do this? I'm like, I can get it done in a week if I have these pieces of information, right? And I didn't get them until after that whole, whole week had already passed. Yeah, mm -hmm. he had finally got, he, he got me all the information the last day of the week and expected me to finish everything. 
So instead of getting all angry at this guy, which I was, like, I was about to lose a bunch of money because he was paying me a decent amount for all this. Uh, I, I was literally I'm in the middle of texting. I'm like, you know, what are you talking about? All this, this. I calmed down. I took a breath. And I literally, I look over. I'm like, all right, what? Because actually in my office, it was or in my, not my office, my cubicle. It was on my like right side of the wall. I had it pinned there. I just look over. I'm like, all right, what are some principles I could use right now? Because I really need them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, and, and, and I calm myself down. I'm like, you know what? You're right. I understand. You know, because then I start. Because the thing about those principles, it's not about persuading people. Like what, one of the biggest things I've I've uh, come to like think about the more I learn about influence is I get very nervous that when I'm talking to somebody, I might accidentally like force them to think something just because I know certain triggers that'll make them think something. And so I, I try never to use that with anyone unless it's something like I'm trying to convince a family member to lose weight because like that's not bad in any sense. Right. Like, you know, that's like the only time I'll try to persuade someone. But right. when I'm just trying to like put forth my uh, my opinions, I, I don't try to persuade people. Uh, I just want them to know what I know. And then I want to know what they know. And then we can both, you know, change our yeah. mind or keep our opinions. And so basically, as I'm reading the principles, Sorry, I'm, you get the charger for that. You know, Sorry. As a, oh, no problem. And as I'm reading the principles, I realize, uh, you know, like one of them is like, you know, never tell them they're wrong and realize that, you know, they like, what was it? Uh, nobody cares about how much you know until they know how much you care. That's Jamal. And, then, and that was like one of the biggest takeaways I got was I, I'm like looking at this and I'm going, oh, man, like, yeah, I, I really like I understand where he's coming from because he doesn't know what I know. Like he's not a web designer. He's not a graphic designer. He doesn't know how long it might take. And right now he's just a customer that wanted something by a date and, you know, it didn't happen. So instead yeah. of, you know, trying to turn the tables on him and prove to him he's wrong, which would have gotten nothing but both of us more upset, uh, mm -hmm. I calm down. I, I'm like going through the principles. I'm like, all right, like I understand why you're upset. It's perfectly reasonable. Um, you know, I, he, here's the things that, you know, I really, you know, I really needed uh, to do. Um, you know, I'm sorry I didn't communicate that better to begin with, you know, et cetera. You know, I, you know, I hope we can still keep working together. And immediately it was the coolest thing because after reading that book, cause I had it, like I said, I had an audible form or audio form. And so as I was listening to the book, I remember them describing scenarios that were in the book, like the guy with the, uh, Oh, they were, um, they delivered wood and they were testing it. They're like, this wood is nothing like I wanted. And they're like, Oh, we, we apologize. Like it's our fault. Like, you know, please describe like what, what was wrong so we could fix this in the future. And they're like, Oh, you'd be lucky if you get anything in the future. And it's like, yeah, I totally understand. Like you guys, you, I understand this could hurt your business. That's let's discuss this. And as the guy starts talking, he realized, you know, the, the, the customer, they start realizing like, Oh, maybe I did mess up because the guy was so nice. Yeah. He was so for, you know, he's just like, what, you know, what are you guys, uh, you know, what are you guys, uh, you know, mad, you know, mad about like, Oh my God. Like I just realized I'm, I'm the guy, I'm the asshole. Right. And so, <laughs> uh, so what ended up happening was I, I send these text messages to this guy. I, and all of a sudden he immediately messaged me like, Oh, awesome. Like, let's get this stuff done. Like completely 180. Like he was about to fire me as, you know, you know, as a contractor for doing this work and immediately yeah. he's like, Oh, like how, like how soon can we get this done? Like yeah. completely 180. And like that, that mm. one incident was definitely something that shaped how I deal with anybody yeah. now. Like I never try to push any, like the moment I see um, any form of hesitation or disbelief or, um, you know, just concern when I'm describing anything, I dial it right back. I'm just like, you know, but like, oh, what do you think? Like, you know, I, I, I want to know where their brain is going. And uh, actually one other little book, this one's not psychology. I'll, it's not directly psychology. But a great book that I actually learned um, a lot of those cues from to realize like, oh, hey, are, are they um, are they like understanding what I'm saying? Are they not agreeing? Are they uncomfortable? Was uh, this one right here. What Everybody is Saying by Joe Navarro yeah. and right. fantastic, fantastic book on body reading. He's a former okay. FBI agent and he talks about um, understanding how people move. And, and the fact that like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, like, you know, just put them up to a lie detector test. Lie detector test um, actually will, will show a positive to a plant if you set it up correctly. So lie detector tests actually aren't as effective as people think. They're only yeah. on average about 60% effective at knowing if you're lying, but not what part you're lying about or, um, right. you know, why you might be lying as opposed yeah. to like, you know, accusatory, like, oh, you're trying to say someone did something as opposed to like, trying to deflect something or maybe it just makes you uncomfortable so you lie about it and that's one of the big right. things i learned from that is you don't don't try to assume 
that you you know you're a body reader like even after reading that book like it's not like you all of a sudden know that this person is lying or this person is angry it's just more that you know that they're uncomfortable you know that there's something yeah. um disconnected between what you're saying and what they're thinking right and uh and so yeah basically uh you know like i said it's like then to sum it all up after as i got um towards the uh the end of my career at my previous workplace um that was one of the biggest things i had done was slowly change my mindset not just not just understanding how other people work but understanding how i work and yeah along that path uh i was able to start networking with incredible people uh i i, re- I also had some like amazing opportunities to, essentially fall into my lap but because i happened to be sitting in the right spot right like i chose to sit in a different place than i was supposed to be and because of that i you know metaphorically and so because of that i had things you know fall to my lap and i ended up going to yeah. conf- tech a couple of tech conferences i ended up uh, meeting with uh, tons of incredible people i started networking with people on instagram you know that kind of thing yeah. and i started gaining yeah. invaluable resources to the point where uh, i ended up taking this online uh, marketing course <laughs> that ended up uh, recently talking about how, or uh, I took it, I think, uh, I don't know, let's say six months ago. And one of the things I talked about was when you're networking, like obviously be in a local chamber of commerce, which I am. And uh, one of the other ones was like, you know, try to connect with the BNI. And I hadn't really looked into it much. Uh, oh, sorry. BNI is a, a business networking international. I think it's called something like that, but essentially they're local chapters where uh, in that chapter, you can only have one person from various industries and uh, the goal is for you to all get referrals for each other. If you don't get referrals mm-hmm. to each other, you can end up getting kicked out. If you don't show up every single week, you can end up getting kicked out. It's very stringent, but it's, it's very powerful. And one of the things they said was whether or not you join one or not, find somebody who's in one and connect with them and try to get um, in there. And so last week, I ended up going to a networking event um, that actually my dad ended up telling me about. And I go there, I end up networking with one of my dad's friends, and he's part of a B&I group. Ironically, because that guy brought up, I found out my dad was part of a BNI group. <laughs> and, <right>. then, <laughs> and so, literally this morning, that's where I was. I, I was actually at a BNI meeting, um, mm-hmm. meeting new people. And he, because I was a visitor, technically I cannot ask for referrals, but I'm still allowed to give. It's like a 45 second commercial about yourself. And so, um, the other people that are BNI members, they'll give that same commercial. But within there, they'll be like, "I'm also looking for maybe single moms who just bought a new home." You know, something like that. Like they'll, they'll be very specific about what they're looking for. But for me, yeah. I just got to describe what I do. And so after I was done, I immediately had a few people end up talking to me, even though I did not. I, I told them what I do and what niche I work in, but not who I'm looking for. So I kind of got around the uh, telling them what I'm looking for by going, you know, I do digital media marketing and social media marketing. I work with Facebook, Instagram. I work with web design, logos and branding. I described a scenario where I helped restructure a local business. Uh, changing their name, changing their website, and through that, actually helping them gain more clients. And now they're, you know, ranked number one uh, for the 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 um, with the niche that they're in and the local city. And immediately they come up number one, which has gotten them quite a few clients now. Uh, not an yep. excessive amount, not to the degree I'd like, but enough that it's like, oh, like it works. And yeah. so I, I happen to just give that little story. And then I go, so basically I enjoy working with, like not I'm looking for, but like I enjoy working with fitness, health, nutrition, because I like promoting that, which I do. And so when yeah. I sat down immediately, con- con- conveniently, I'm also sitting next to a nutritionalist who works for a company that sells health products. And she's like, yeah. I've got a bunch of referrals for you. <laughs> right. And so I was like, that's, that's incredible. So I, I, I collected everyone there's business card and, um, I'm going to start uh, contacting them actually probably after this interview right. uh, because so we're holding you back. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry. They're, they're, you know, they're all at work now. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was, that was a big thing was um, the ability to network with people and connect with people, understanding that, um, you know, a lot of the time people, when they go, I, I actually hate this. I had a, um, a friend of mine do this to me once and uh, it was very unsettling when it happens, but essentially you should never give anything with the expectation of receiving. Um, one of the mm-hmm. books we were talking about last time uh, and one of the most powerful books on uh, psychology, specifically when it comes to uh, business, is uh, Influence. I think this was written yeah. in like the 80s, yeah. I believe. It, it was written a while ago. Um, and it actually took a while to make headway as well because a lot of marketers and advertisers follow these very specific rules and they didn't realize that they could be using, you know, essentially psychology to work. Psychology um, and business, in favor. yeah. 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 And so 
what ends up happening is, uh, or uh, what ended up happening was there's that law of reciprocity. And this friend of mine uh, is someone who definitely was taught it the wrong way and essentially was like, hey, here's something for you. I'm like, oh, cool. That's awesome. She's like, by the way, would you be able to do this thing for me? And I'm like, uh, I've already kind of, you know, voiced my opinion on that. I'm not a fan of promoting that. And they're like, oh, I just got this thing for you. And now you're just going to, you know, basically give me the finger. And I'm like, whoa, like you, you came just offering something and then you yeah. immediately did the ask. And uh, mm. if, you, if anyone here follows Gary V, you know that the, <laughs> the code is jab, 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 right hook. And the, the uh, translation is give, 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 ask, right? Yeah. And so you, you shouldn't go into and anything. Not, not give, 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 expect. <laughs> yeah. Well, not, not only that, it's also not give right, right hook, right? Or jab, yeah. right hook. It's jab, yeah. jab, jab, right hook. You should always try to give much more than you Build. ever uh, even think. Like, even if you want to expect something in return, right? You should never give less than you expect or equal you should always give more than you would ever expect but yeah, yeah. and then gary's biggest thing is don't expect anything and, and then then if anything happens it's just gravy right like you're like wow that's awesome like you know i wasn't expecting you to do anything for me and ironically mm -hmm. some of the greatest connections i've gotten and some of the greatest um things that have happened for me were when i was just giving stuff away then I forgot, like, I forgot I was helping them. And all of a sudden yeah. I get a response later, like, you know, thanks. Like, that was really awesome. Like, is there something I could do for you? And like, that's tremendous. Like just the feeling too, like, I, you know, you're like, yeah. oh, like, I'm, I'm glad that helped, helped you. Like, that's cool. Like, um, I, yeah. I'm not really looking for anything, but I, I guess this is what I'm working on. It's like, oh, well, you know, I have a connection over here. Right. And that's, yeah. that's slowly how I started building my network from not mm -hmm. knowing um, many people at all. Uh, especially in bigger businesses to go into a tech conference, uh, joining a group, actually, uh, it's called Propelify. And what ended up happening was within, uh, I, I, I joined them probably in like August and by maybe um, February or January, I think I became an admin on their page. Like it was crazy. Like just the, just mm -hmm. by giving a lot of advice, giving a lot of help, um, recommending a lot of books. That was one of the big things I kept doing. And um I think the final like ask that I got from them was uh, they had asked like, Oh, what was your favorite book from last year? And I was like, Oh Jesus. Like what was my favorite book per category? I could maybe narrow it down that way. And I listed off six categories and like, these were all my favorite books. And I ended up getting yeah. uh, connected with um, the founder of it. Like, Hey, let's work on this uh, book club. Uh, you know, we, they wanted to start a book club for their organization. So I ended up getting into that. And through that, I met even more people and ultimately, uh, while after I attended the the latest um, event that they held, because they hold one a year at the uh, mid May, uh, I ended up meeting another um, person who helped work on the pro on the actual uh, event. And after talking with him, he goes, "By the way, that whole book club thing, I actually have a connection to uh, Penguin Publishing House, or the what was it Penguin Random House, which is a publishing company like a, like uh, let's see." Well, oh, the book I'm reading right now, it's over there. It's, uh, it's Drive. That's, that's published by them. And so he All was right. like, I, I figured that'd be a good connection for you. And I was like, holy crap. Like, I, I'm going to connect with somebody from a major publishing company just from, do, like, just from giving stuff. I, was, I, I think I ended up doing um, three months of that book club where I, I spoke for like anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours just breaking down a book. And there wasn't even many people in the live feed at the time, but a lot of people watched it later, apparently, and yeah. you know were very, um, very much enjoyed it. And uh, yeah. I think I think the final time I did it, I accidentally uh, I accidentally broke Facebook, so I, I couldn't. I didn't actually end up sharing it with anyone. So for an hour and a half, I talked to myself, <laughs> and I wasn't even aware of it <laughs> until it was all done. And then it turns out yeah. the the uh, the program that was supposed to record it, I forgot to hit the check mark to record it. So not only did I talk to myself for an hour and a half. I couldn't even upload that anywhere later. So <laughs> just, yeah, I just sat yeah. by myself talking for an hour and a half and it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. But uh, one, one of the other big um, things I gained from the whole giving without any expectation is one thing a lot of people um, don't realize is that whenever you teach someone, you actually, you not only, um, you know, first off, if you're going to teach someone, you have to remember everything you learned. So you end up doing a little bit more research just to remember what you learned. But mm, when you as a higher level of learning, yeah, it, once you actually try to have to explain it to somebody else, 
you end up, uh, yeah, gaining even more knowledge than you originally uh, maintained from the initial read through or learning or session yeah. that you gained it's that the, knowledge. Yeah, it's retaining, like you're saying, retaining rather than just reading the book and having it in your notes or even highlights. The second part of that is actually when you teach it, you go through that process of like almost instantly I try to teach what I've read. Um, I don't, I, don't I, I think I do it subconsciously, but I, I end up teaching people around me what I've just read. Uh, you can't help yourself. Yeah, I mean, like, interesting here's, stuff here's to all you. this stuff in my head. I, I want someone else to hear it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, just, you retain it better when you teach it to people, definitely. The, the teacher yeah. learns more than the student. Yeah, and, and one of the big things um, I also picked up, uh, this, this one concept I've known for a while because I, I used to hate some of my professors in college because you could tell they were there for research money and they were terrible teachers. They were definitely professors. And uh, one of the things is that, uh, I think this is a quote from Einstein, if you can't explain it in simple terms, you don't know it well enough. And that was one of the big things I took was that if I can't teach like my little, my, my little brother, my little sister, one of the concepts I learned, then maybe I really don't know that concept. Like I, maybe I have yeah. these random words in my head. So if I go talk at a business meeting, you know, people are like, oh, he's smart. But like I wouldn't be able to actually um, delve deeper into that same subject. And uh, very recently, uh, because I, I, I fell prey to one of the cognitive biases, which I know we were talking about before uh, on that other mm -hmm. call. Um, yeah was uh yeah i could it was hard for me to explain some of the stuff i knew a lot of it was like innate like i just would do something and it would work because i just i just knew it and i wanted mm -hmm. to be able to start explaining that because if i ever have to hire somebody to do something that i know i have to then teach them and i don't want them to have to spend three years yeah. reading books to have this revelation and then realize what they needed to learn i want to be able to break it down much easier for them and that's the whole point of getting a mentor it's like you, you don't want to you don't yeah. want to um waste your time trying to learn something someone else already learned and not only did they learn it they figured out how to explain it better so you can get it without having to fail and yeah. uh that latest book can that i helped add on yeah. an extra bit to what you said there because it's quite interesting it is what i read in a book called how to read a book and he said that <laughs> something very similar to einstein he said that if you can't explain the book the whole as a whole in your own words, not just in like quotes or what's on the blurb, not just memorizing the blurb, but actually that's what you would ask his students if, what, what, the, what was the book about? And then they were like, hmm, I'm not very sure. Then they didn't learn the book. So yeah, that's one way to figure out if you could, if you could do a book review on a book, then you've learned it. Yeah, that, that, that's huge too, which is probably one of the reasons I really started putting those book posts on uh, Instagram was that it was almost a way for me to recap what I learned because most of those books, like I do, I, I try to post like the, the book of the week, although it's not, it's not every week. Um, at one point I was reading a book a week, but I wasn't keeping up on my Instagram with that. So like every time yeah. I post a book, it's like, I think my last post was like six or seven books ago, something like that. Yeah. And so like I'm, I'm far behind on the books I have re already read that I haven't posted. So by the time I have to post them again, I actually have to recap what I learned. And it's been very helpful doing that. Um, but uh, one of the latest books I, I was getting to was uh, this one, Made to Stick. And this yeah. one was incredibly useful for um, being able to take an idea and then teach somebody it. And mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's the whole concept of making an idea sticky. And yeah. it's, great, it's great for like teachers. It's great for like business coaches, for example. If you're trying to teach somebody how to do something, don't give them the raw facts and data. You need to teach them in a way that they will retain that information. And that's a huge deal because a lot yeah. of people, they'll pay like thousands of dollars for some business coach to come in and fix their, you know, fix their community for a little bit. They change yeah. for like a month and then it goes back to the way it was. And then you have to end up paying that same guy again. And that's why there are some business coaches that are like, yeah, it'll be a hundred thousand dollars because if I come in, your business will be forever changed. And so yeah. that's, that's a, a big deal for a lot of people is, uh, you know, the ability to remember what the hell was taught to you. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, you've not really <laughs> read a book if you, can't re if you can't retain it. So that's it. Ideally, you read less books and retain more and read them in more depth and get quality reading at time in rather than audiobooks can be a good way to, to learn. But if you're distracted and doing other things, you don't retain it half as well as 
you as you read even if you if you're a better listener i think having that piece while you're doing it if, at least sitting away in silence if you're going to listen to an audiobook be alone and uh, not doing too much because you're not retaining it as well there's there's maybe these exceptions <laughs> yeah but well that, that's, that's one of the big reasons they say you should if you're gonna listen to an audiobook it's good like on the way to work like you're driving especially if you have a long commute because if you're doing that it's like most of your driving is automatic. So unless someone cuts you off oh, yeah. or, you know, there's an accident um, or some holdup, it's usually a lot easier to retain that because everything else you're doing is automatic and you're just putting in knowledge. And even if it's just mm -hmm. subconsciously, and that's, that's one of the big things uh, we were talking about last time is the, uh, the subconscious uh, thoughts that the more you put in there, eventually, like you might come up with an idea that was a combination of multiple ideas because they've just been floating in your subconscious um, yes. but like, that's, I, I agree though. Like the, the audio books, like those first two I picked up, I definitely needed them to be audio books. If I got those books, I, I have the physical books now. There's no way that on the first day of reading, I would have ever have gotten through those books. I, I wouldn't have gotten through the first chapter. I'd have been like, Oh, I'm going to go to sleep now. And, yeah. uh, so that helped a lot. And then there's other books where, you know, like, I'm definitely glad I have the story. Like, this is fantastic. Like, I'm glad I can hear it in my own head. Uh, or if there's no audio book that the author reads it, I can read it in the author's voice. And then um, one, one of the biggest ones that I've picked up recently is uh, there's a book called Principles by Ray Dalio, probably one of the best business books I've ever read. But uh, it's like 680 pages long. Um, it, it's, it's massive. And he actually tells you, you don't have to read the first section because it's basically his life story, but it's interesting. So he included it. He almost didn't, but he did anyways. And then the uh, next section, he's like, read through this thoroughly. Th these are the principles that I gained from the, that life experience. And I've created these set of life principles. Yeah. And then finally, he's like, the, the final section is called work principles. And these you do not need to read through. They're very um, uh, monotone, very, very uh, dry. And because of okay. that, um, you can use it more like an encyclopedia, like, oh, I need to, I need to help work with a, a, an employee or something that's causing problems. Like, there's a section for that. There's principles on that. But I had to give a – this was part of one of the books I did for the, um, the book review. I think it was actually – or the book club. I think it was actually the first one I did, now that I think about it. And uh, it, it was – I couldn't get through it. I got through the first, like, uh, 400 pages, and now I'm in that work section – and I'm like, I, I'm going to pass out. I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. So what I know I, what you mean. So what I ended up doing was I ended up getting um, uh, Audible. I ended up downloading the book, and I ended up listening to it while reading it. And every once in a while, I'd zone out, and I'd be like, oh, what words was I on? Because, again, it was dry. But by doing it that way, it was much easier to, um, to absorb that information as well. Like, there's still a lot of stuff I retained from that that I normally wouldn't because I was not only seeing it and physically flipping through the pages – I was hearing it. So, and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's the whole thing is I'm adding multiple senses and the more senses you add, the higher the retention rate of whatever it is you're trying to learn, whether it's yeah. a physical activity or knowledge uh, based. Yeah. I heard that your, your friend Ty Lopez actually say something <laughs> like that. Uh, that it's like putting yourself in a, or I, I think he was quoting uh, Richard Dawkins and um, it's like putting yourself in a, a virtual or a, a simulator and gaining yeah, experience from other people's lives. Yeah. yeah. So like, like you're saying, the more sort of senses and the ways that you, you learn that, like I, I used a good example when I, I went to see Grant Cardone live in the conference, nice. as well as listening to his audiobooks, as well as reading some of the parts that he, that he teaches in the 10X rule and sell or be sold. So you're, you're spot on there because you get different senses when you go to see a person live versus audiobooks versus physical books. So you get as close as you can to actually experiencing it yourself. Oh, yeah. Well, that's also one of the reasons why uh, Gary, he talks about he puts content out every day. And some people message him going like, you put out the same stuff every day. And he's like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's because it's accurate. I'm just trying to get it out there. But he says it. He says the reason he does it is that maybe this one time in this one place, you're in the right mindset, maybe because of all these other physical sensations um, that set you so that when you hear – the, this thing that he's been repeating all of a sudden you're like whoa kind of like, like your the, paradigm shift yeah yeah it's like yeah it's like yeah, exactly i was gonna say like when i was listening to that audiobook i i was driving to a job that was slowly getting more demoralizing 
And so I'm just like, you know, what else do I got to lose? I'm listening to this. And all of a sudden, like, bam. Like, obviously, people know it's good to read, but nobody, nobody reads. Like, when, when I hear that the average person read one book a year, I was like, I don't think I can list somebody who reads a book at all. Like, after I got out of high school. So who are, the, who are these magic people that are outweighing everyone? It must be those CEOs that are reading 60 books, accounting for the extra 59 people that aren't reading. And so... Um, you know, obviously like I knew that it was good to read, but I didn't realize what I would actually gain from it. And so like, yeah, that, I, I needed that, that moment where it was auditory and I was like, Oh, yeah. like that made sense. And like, that yeah, was like that, everything I, I needed. I had another, another word for paradigm shift, which is the fancy way of saying the aha moment is when everything that you're, you believe in or you think or you do starts to completely change and it can happen overnight like we discussed or it can happen over a set period of time so just so people understand that paradigm shift is that aha moment that you have when you've probably heard it a couple of times from different mentors or teachers or books or audiobooks and radios and things then one time someone says almost the same thing in a different context and a different story that relates more to you and you're like oh i've heard that before but that makes more sense this time it's like your, 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 your dad or your mum or your parents telling you something. You don't, it's like we don't listen to our parents as much as we listen to <laughs> someone that we respect, like a celebrity that we know or something. So that's, I just wanted to get that point out because it was something I want to touch on before when you mentioned paradigm shift that, so people know exactly what, uh, that, what we're talking about there. So it's the aha moment. Yeah, and that's, that's actually a big one. Uh, there's another book I have up on my shelf above my desk. It's called uh, You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. And uh, the, the, the thing that's interesting about that is the, the author says she has a friend who got a tattoo under her arm that says, uh, ah, or duh, is D-U-H, duh. And the reason for that was that um, every time that you really have like a full, like, so like the, the difference between just, just a uh, paradigm shift and an aha moment is that aha moment is that instantaneous paradigm shift where you're like, oh, like, whoa, like everything I thought was different. And what would happen is usually when that happens, you're like, oh, like, right? Like you throw your arms yeah. up. And the point was that most aha moments, most paradigm shifts are things that are actually very obvious, but they're super powerful. And so mm. she put duh under her arm. So whenever she'd raise her hands in like disbelief, it was like, oh yeah, that was actually yeah. pretty <laughs> obvious. I should have known yeah. that. And, and then you yeah. laugh it off, but like now it's, now it's stuck in there. And ironically, um, we were talking about this before uh, on the previous call about how one of the greatest ways to retain um, any information is to have an emotion attached to it. Uh, one, of the, one of the big things that I learned through a lot of the psychology books, as well as um, books about the physiology of your brain, is that as you're, um, as you're engaging in an activity, if emotion becomes attached to it, uh, the, the wiring in your brain uh, is much stronger. And so... Uh, I was talking about the big fish story where essentially when, you know, you you know, say your uncle or your grandfather, or whatever, they go out and they catch a, they catch a fish and they know it was this big, but then they're like, yeah, I caught a fish and it was this big. You're like, yeah, right. You know, grandpa. Right. But the next time they go to tell that, uh, what they do is they try to remember how big the fish was. But the thing was, they said it was this big and they don't remember that they, they know they wanted to say the fish was bigger. So they're like, Oh yeah, it was this big. And so they're like, yeah, actually the fish was this big. And because what's happening is there wasn't a lot of emotion in the initial catch of the fish. It wasn't a big fish. And so every time they tell the story though, they're actually creating a new memory for themselves. And so every time it's like, Oh yeah, I think the fish was actually this big. So it must've been this big. Like it's just, it's off camera now. It's huge. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's what happens with your memories is that every time, like right now, like any, anyone who's listening or listens later, like if you're like, remember the bike when you're a kid and you think about it and there's not a lot of emotion attached. You're like, yeah, I had a bike when I was a kid. And, uh, and it's like, oh, what color was it? Right. Well, if you say the wrong color now, the next time you go to remember it, you're likely to remember this new color you just made up, even if it was never true. And so you're like, yeah, it was purple. And then the next time you're like, yeah, I think it was like a midnight purple. You know what? I think it was like, a dark midnight purple with like, I think scratches of rust in it. And then later you find out the bike was red because you find a picture of it and you're like, Oh, Oh, I swear it was purple. And the thing is that it's not that your memory's bad. It's that that's how you actually remembered it. Your, your memories from your past aren't um, like 
unchanging. Like you can change what you think about to the degree where you remember different things. Um, there's, there's been people that have gone to jail over false accusations where later a psychologist broke it down and like, turns out like they actually remembered the wrong thing. And so that it's a, your brain is, uh, your, your brain is very powerful to you, but if you learn to control it, it can be powerful for you. And, uh, yeah. that, that's one of the, um, the big things that I learned through a lot of this was that like, Oh, like if, if I start to think certain ways, I can change it. And one of the most powerful ways to do that is if you want to have a good memory that causes you to do better things is you want to attach an emotion to it. Because when you do that, it's much harder to change that memory. And it's actually why like uh, people with PTSD, it's very difficult for them uh, to forget it because anytime they have that memory, it actually re-triggers the emotions as well. And so that's why um, the only way that you uh, can help someone with PTSD, uh, you know, if you're a psychologist, first off, you should never try it on your own because you can cause bad things. But the point is that um, the way that they'll do it is they'll bring you back to that memory. And while you're remembering it, they will try to change how you feel about it. And if they can do that, they can then now alter the, the memory, right? That's how, that's how people can like fully recover. Not everyone can, but well, it's not that not everyone can, but maybe not everyone also chooses to. I don't know if everyone can. I'm not, I'm not a uh, full brain scientist or anything like that. Uh, but, <laughs> Very close you know, to a uh, psychologist though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like it's, that, that's a big, um, a big thing though is that you can utilize that to your advantage as opposed to only being taken advantage by it. So like that's how a lot of people fall into the, the victimhood mentality is they attach this, this traumatic thing that happened to them and then they have an emotion on it. And now it's like, that's everything. Anytime I think anything about that subject, this full memory appears again and it overwhelms me. So I can't do anything. As opposed how, can, to, how, how can we use yeah. that in a positive way? Like I, I remember you told me something about that, but how can the people listening and watching use that yeah. same thing in a positive way? So one of the things that I did, and I, I remember talking about this last time was uh, th uh, this book right here, Think and Grow Rich. It's one of the, uh, best-selling um, self-help books ever. It's also one of those ones that's like, oh, think and grow rich. Yeah, money will appear because I thought about it. Um, and obviously, it doesn't work that way. But um, it's a turn-off before, like, for people who yeah. think, <laughs> think about the book cover and what the title is, it might be put off before they've even yeah, tried it. Ex yeah. yeah, exactly. There's 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 a couple of books I've picked up that are like that, where it's like, uh, you know, they're like, oh, how to become rich on the internet, and it's like, oh, wow, yeah, right, but. That's probably one of the best books about how to get yeah. rich on the internet. For, the Four Hour Work Week is one of my favorite uh, self help business books. And again, it looks like it's a book for lazy people who want to get into yeah. business. <laughs> but there's a lot of work to be done if you read the book and uh, take it in. It's, it's a very good book. It's one of them as well. It's like four hours a week. Oh, you yeah. Can't do that and they, they won't bother reading the book. I heard Grant Cardone actually say that. I wouldn't read the book because it's called for a work week. <laughs> yeah, well, the funny thing too is that um, that book uh, was almost called the two hour work week. And he realized right. he's like, cause he actually figured out he was actually only working two hours a week, but he's like, right. man, like that's, that's really not believable. No one's gonna <laughs> take that. I'm like, if I say four, I guess that's a little better. And so they had to change the name. Uh, and it's funny because I think when he first um, put it to the publishers. That's what it was. Was the, uh, he, he had done like testing to figure out a couple of different names, but one of the names he came up with was the two hour work week. And when he put that to them, they're like, yeah, no, like we're not going to publish that book yeah, yeah. because no one's going to buy it. No, why would anyone yeah. think that you could work two hours a week and live the rich life? Mm -hmm. And so it, it is funny. So it's the same with this. This book has, it has that turn off, but it's, it is, it's one of the most powerful books um, for self-help. And the one chapter that I go to over and over and over again is the, uh, the chapter on auto suggestion. Uh, I don't actually do what he recommends, which is he actually recommends, you, recommends that you read that one chapter over and over and over again. And uh, it's the chapter uh, of auto suggestion, which essentially is by telling yourself something, uh, you can convince yourself that it's real. And so uh, the whole think and grow rich concept is like, you know, I have a million dollars in my bank account, right? It's like, I don't have a million dollars in my bank account, but you say that to yourself. You say that over and over again until one day you're just like, I'm a, I have a millionaire. Where's my money? Like, what, what are millionaires supposed to be doing right now? And you start changing what you do based on what you believe. And that's one of the big things that I took away from that. But it actually goes even deeper than that to the point where it was the story I was telling you where 
I was testing this theory out, like how powerful can it be? And so for about uh, a month straight after reading that book, every night I went to bed, I told myself, all right, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. But I didn't just say like that. I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. I would like get my, get my seat, uh, get myself into a state of some form of emotion, whether it was like angry, like I'm going to wake up or like, you know, there's going to be something awesome tomorrow. I'm going to wake up or like, you know, almost sad. Like I can't let these people down, you know, uh, you know, I got to wake up. Right. And so I did that for a month and it did not matter what time I went to bed. I would set my alarm for 6 a.m. And I would wake up at 5:59, right before the alarm clock would go off every day. There was, there was days I went to bed at 4:30 in the morning and I woke up, at 5:59, and it was like it was almost terrifying. I got to the point where I'm like, I'm I'm not even gonna do that anymore because that's a bit unsettling. Like how much your brain has control over you, and if you tell it the right thing, it can do some powerful things. And that's why yeah. you get, you know, you, that's also why you can get people that are like, you know, you know, psychopathic, uh, not necessarily sociopath because that can be a, a physiological thing, but psychopathic because they tell themselves <laughs> some pretty crazy things. But then there's also the flip side of that where most people who become successful tell you that in order to become successful, you actually have to be crazy enough to believe it can happen. Yeah. Right? And so that's, and it's, that's... it's like what we were talking about. I, I, the, we originally started that conversation because I was, I, I was reading a lot about Eckhart Tolle on the ego. And I was asking, I was trying to get over the question of, is the ego, like, he, it felt like the ego is a negative thing and your ego is your false sense of self or your identity that you have for yourself and your based on your past. So like I asked you the question, is the, is the ego just a negative thing that we need to completely get rid of? Uh, but then you came up with a great idea about using, because we can't fully get rid of ego because that makes us humans, as one of my mentors said. So you, you can manipulate your ego in a positive way to make positive actions because you create a, a better identity of yourself in your mind which yeah, results absolutely. in those actions. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, essentially your ego is just the accumulation of thoughts that you've had that have now created what is an identity. Um, i trying to remember what book. Actually, do I have that one over here? Yeah. There's, um, tribes. I'm not going to pick it up because now it's underneath all of those books and I'm going to knock something over. But um, most people put themselves into some category. It's actually the whole reason why we have like, you know, huge tensions in the state right now. And actually in a lot of other countries in the world is that, people put themselves into a category of what they think they are. Like, oh, I'm an athlete or, oh, I'm, a, I'm the, the nerd, right? Like that kind of thing. And by doing that, you, you limit what you think you can do. And so that's also the same reason why people fight with each other because they're like, no, this is how it is because this is what this identity tells me it is. As opposed to, oh, well, maybe, maybe that identity is useful sometimes, but not for this. Like, you know, maybe yeah. an athlete's not the best person to be a brain surgeon, right? Like, yeah. it's not that Could they could be. Bit, yeah. Just to, to label that, it's, it's a limiting belief, as Tony Robbins labels that idea. It's a good way, it's a good way to explain that, as it's a limiting belief. Exactly. And, it, and it's, it's funny, because, like, it's not so much that you think you can't do it. It's just that you think you're someone who can't do it. And that's a, that's a huge distinction, because so many people they try to, they're like, Oh, like I could never do that. It's like, you know, I could never be a pro basketball player. It's like, what are you talking about? There's people that are like five, four that are pro basketball players. Like that's crazy. Like, right. They obviously have amazing competitors, but like there's people that don't meet the, uh, you know, the, the cookie cutter identity that you would picture for various tasks or abilities. And yet they still do it. And that's because they create an identity around themselves where they're like, this is what I do. Right. Like I am this person. And I, I am capable of these things. And uh, one of, one of the, uh, the, the best people to follow on that is, uh, I mentioned before, Tom Bilyeu, the uh, co-founder of, um, was it Quest Impact Nutrition? And then, yeah. and, then, and then eventually Impact Theory. And his whole goal with that is to, you know, break people out of the matrix. It's to, instead of, instead of thinking like, oh, like I'm supposed to go to school, then I go to college, then I get a job, and if I save enough money, I can retire – you know, at the age of like death because of, you know, nobody's getting paid enough uh, to be able to retire early enough and because there won't be any money for you by the time you get there if you follow the normal path, right? And so people like, then, then it's like, oh, well, you could open your own business. And then it's like, well, I'm not one of those people. It's like, what do you mean one of those people? Like that's, that's a, a, a belief of your identity that just doesn't match this potential new identity. Yeah, you can't, and, yeah it's holding you back from 
getting through that is a belief yeah, that's absolutely. all it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, um, what a lot of books will do, um, and actually like you were saying, the, uh, was it a new world? A new earth. Yeah. A new earth. That's what it was. Yeah. Um, you know, you're talking about how it kind of sounds like you should like avoid your ego, like push it to the side. Um, but the thing is that I think, I, I believe, um, a lot of like, uh, stoic philosophers kind of have a similar take on that where they say like, you know, you're going to have these things you want to do, but you know, be strong enough not to do them. But, uh, you know, that's, that's good for when you want to do something so unbelievable. Like, uh, there's some people that are like, I want to, uh, uh, actually a great example of that Propelify event, um, that I went to this past year, tons of stuff went wrong right before, like, you know, the week before the event that should have made it almost impossible to get you know, pulled off. And because a bunch of people were able to be like, no, no, we got to get it done as opposed to like sticking to their ego going, no, like everything was supposed to work this way because I'm an entrepreneur that does it this way. And I was prepared and I did all the right stuff. And instead, instead of falling prey to that, they were like, nope, switch modes. Now I'm in control. I'm going to make sure that I finish everything that I said I was going to finish. Right. And so that's why it's good to be able to fight against your ego when it might hold you back. And the, uh, the cool thing about that is if you can actually fight past that, you can potentially alter your ego as well. You can actually get it to the point where your, your ego is like, oh, I, I guess that is something we can do, check, right? And now you have an, another, another barrier you can break through. But uh, what a lot of people do try to do is they try to just like, you know, strong arm it through that. But then the problem, that's, that's how people who try to lose weight and then gain it all back fall prey to that. They don't, t they don't try to tell themselves, like what they do is they fight their ego and they're like, oh, I'm just going to go to the gym every day, even though I hate it. As opposed to going, man, I love, I love the gym. Even if you're lying to yourself, it's like, I love the I'm someone who loves going to the gym. Not just I do love the gym or not I go to the gym. I'm someone who goes to the gym. And by slowly altering your identity, even if it's false at first, that's the whole fake it till you make it. Like you can't really, you know, put on a suit and walk and do a business and be like, yeah, I know how to do accounting. But if you want to be someone who can learn to do accounting, then you have to switch that part of your identity. And so that, that's the biggest takeaway I got from a lot of the, uh, you know, the self-help or self-improvement or the psychology or even physiology books was like, these are how you alter your mind to the point where you can start doing things that at one point your past self wouldn't even believe you were capable of. And, and it's yeah. not just because uh, when you have all that willpower, you're able to fight against your ego it's because you've actually been able to alter uh, that, that identity that's been holding you back to something yeah. else. And I've got something to add on to that is on top of that, when you surpass that section of your, your ego that's holding you back, that's almost collective, like uh, the people around you will have very similar uh, identities and beliefs about how things work and how far you can go. But if you think of the mindset of people, the super successful people, they've obviously changed how they, how they do things from the norm. And I, I've started to push beyond what I used to believe in and what was holding me back and what holds mo the majority of people back. And I noticed just the other day that I mentioned my, my new uh, challenge that I'm on at getting f up at 4.45. And I always wondered how the, how the rock got up at like, four in the morning and things. And I thought, no, I'm going to get up at the same time as the rock. <laughs> just to challenge myself because uh, I, I believe in all this stuff as well and I was like no, I'm going to take on the rock or like I, I've said before like w I read about the ancient Greeks and things so I, I get quite competitive in the way that like they're just human why can't we do it so I look at things like that in that way with my, my beliefs of all the uh, changing my limiting beliefs or removing them and you, there, it's limitless once you get to that stage and people around you will still try to pull you down because you've got these new beliefs. So you have to defend yourself of that as well and make sure that you're shining the light on, on like your ego and what, is, that, is this what's holding us back or is this uh, like the people around us bringing that back into our mind that no, you might pass out, Ben, if you get up at 4.45 every morning. Like I've had that <laughs> in my mind over the last 10 days. You're going to end up I'm passing sure. out. You're going to die. <laughs> but there's, there's these things that, will hold you back. Once you even overcome it, you've then got these extra hurdles. So watch out for that as well. Those five people you spend the most time with is very true. And be careful about the advice you take in as well, because you're going to take in some 
subconsciously, even if you've got your hands over your ears. So I just wanted to add that on as well. That is, there's, there's that exterior side of it as well. Because as, you can feed yourself as much as possible. You're going to have the, the influence around you as well. So look out for that. Yeah. And, and actually, one of the things you said that's uh, you know, really important too is that um, it's, it's one, of, one of the mind. So they, obviously, like the next question may be like, what, you know, what mindset do you need to have in order to you know, change what you do? And that's, uh, there's a book called uh, Mindset by uh, Carol Dweck. And what that talks yep. about is instead of, instead of viewing yourself as a fixed identity, such as I am an intelligent person or um, I am an athlete, the other thing you can do to drastically alter how willing your brain is to accept a new identity as well as uh, how willing you are to do something new is to instead of saying, like I said, I'm, I'm the smartest person, say I'm someone who can learn. You know, I'm not I'm not the athlete, but I'm someone who can you who can get who can train and get stronger, right? Like so, that's that's a big um, a big thing I see a lot of people do is that they try to convince themselves that they're the best at something. So as opposed to going, you know, I'm a millionaire, it's I'm someone who can acquire wealth, right? That's more the yeah. growth mentality as opposed to a fixed mentality because. What happens if you reach the million dollar mark, right? You've reached there and then you're stuck because you're a millionaire, right? Mm -hmm. And then, then how you yeah. become the next, you know, like Elon Musk or something like that, right? So yeah. that, that's yeah. a, you know, th that's the way that you can get around that. But, every, you know, sometimes it helps to, like I said, just, just give yourself a, a goal identity of like, I'm going to be a millionaire because it's, it's too hard to like believe like, oh, I can learn all this stuff. But like, if, if there's anyone who thinks they can't become a millionaire in 60 to 80 years, however long you're going to live, right? Like, or a hundred years, like I, I plan on living into my hundreds. So like, that's, that's my thing. Like, if you don't think you can at one point achieve a million dollars, you, you've already got something else you got to solve first, right? Like you've, you've got way too limiting a belief because most people, if they just simply, if, if you just have a, you know, smart investment portfolio. Like there's been people that worked at like UPS that have retired millionaires at the age of 40, just by not spending a lot of money and investing in the right things. So like, it's not, yeah. it's not something that's like an impossible thing that you have to invent something new. Like you can, you can do that just working. So yeah, so like, that's a huge thing that um, a huge hurdle. A lot of people have to get over. And that's why uh, these books are great examples. Not, not, not every book has the same impact, but like a lot of the ones actually Quinn's, Coincidentally, that made to stick actually explained some of the or explained the reason why some of the books I've read, I, I remember almost everything from them. And one of the big reasons is because they were told in some story format. They weren't like, here's a bunch of facts. They were like, hey, here's a lot of interesting information and here's a story about it. And context, here's how yeah. it yeah, yeah. It was not just context as much as um, your brain literally like as we evolved, we would tell stories around a campfire. Like, like that's how we translated knowledge before there was written word before there was, um, you know, books, right? Like they like, we had to communicate and share knowledge in order to advance our, uh, society and civilization anyways. And the way that we did that was through storytelling. So our brains are actually designed to like want to hear a story. In fact, actually, uh, what was it? I can't remember if it was Influence or Robert Cialdini's uh, newest book. I think it might have been this one called uh, Presuasion. I think it was this mm -hmm. one. What he would do is he, he realized that, that story is one of the most powerful ways to impact people. And so what he would do is at the start of his lecture, he would tell the beginning of a story that his class would then teach. And at the end of the class, he'd finish the story. And one day, he's taught, he's going through his class and he realizes he didn't finish the story as the bell goes off. And he's like, Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll finish it later. But then all of a sudden he realizes no one's been standing up. No one's been packing their bag. Like they normally do watching the clock ready to leave. And they're like, no, finish the story. Like you can't just leave right. us hanging <laughs> like that. Like, what are you out of your mind? Is it going to sit with me all day like that? People, people love stories because uh, it, it's literally innate. It's, it's built into our, um, you yeah. know, the way that our brains are shaped and mapped is that we love hearing stories, you know, and that's yeah. why the, the, obviously there's some limitations to that some stories suck, but you know, as long as, mm -hmm. um, they're, they have a certain set of guidelines and rules to the stories, they can be highly impactful. And so the books that have made the most difference to me and the, the ones that have, I've retained the most knowledge from are the ones that are great at storytelling. Yeah. 
yeah, you, you, I think it was something like, you no, know, people will never forget how you made them feel. And it's really true. And you can do that through heartfelt stories. Um, but there was something you said there that I wanted to touch on as well, that there's a, there, for, for example, there's a book called uh, Story Brand, Building Your Story Brand, Donald Donald Miller, Milner, Miller, I think his name is. Miller. Uh, yeah, so a recent Miller. Mark, yeah. He, he's got a really good book on, on that and like the reasons why we must tell stories like, like Walt Disney done with uh, his, his <laughs> movies and have yeah. that kind of plot of the, the baddie, the goodie. And then like you're saying that cliffhanger moment that people want to find out how this is going to end. Is a guy going to die or is a guy going to overcome the, the problem, which is the, the baddie and live happily ever after, which we all kind of want to see. Uh, but he was kind of saying, like bringing this into a business perspective is you, you then make the customer in that story, which can, you can use as a case study, your customer was then the hero and your company and brand becomes the guide for that. And that was kind of the idea of that book. And it's kind of bringing that in because it's a book I, I've been listening to recently. It's on my mind. And on top of that, you said uh, like mytho- uh, stories is what's ingrained to us. And it makes sense because... I think the Bible and everything, there's a lot of mythology. Yeah. And our history is kind of screwed up because of that in a lot of ways because they, they brought the lessons of life into myths and made up people. Who knows if Jesus was a person or not? And th- there's a lot of, supposedly in Wikipedia, he was a real life figure. He was a, per- a person and a historical figure. Um, but there's lots of things against that as well. So it's mythology has been a, a, a servant and a bit of a, a disaster for our history, but oh, yeah. they used that so that people learned the lessons in the right way by telling stories and giving it context and feeling around this one principle, like Ray Dalio's book. Yeah. Well, um, what is it? Uh, the story of Odysseus, for example, like that was passed on for generations without ever being written down. And so there's no way that that's the full story or even the original story. But usually what will happen is as somebody tells a story, there's certain points that are very um, like you you won't forget this because it's a very important part of the story. Just like when, like if I tell you a story, right. And then you go to tell someone else that story, you're not going to tell it verbatim. That's impossible. You know what? No one's Mm -hmm. brains that perfectly, uh, you know, or that good. So you're fish story. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Except that Chinese whispers. Yeah. The only difference though, as opposed to potentially getting, you know, the bigger fish, what you're doing is you're getting all the right details. Like, you know, it was a green fish, you know, it had like this weird fin because that was the part that was important for the story. Right. And so it's the important parts that got remembered. And that's the, one of the reasons they expect that the uh, story of Odysseus is such a great story is that all of the, the fluff, like if anyone's a Dragon Ball Z fan, like that, those eight episodes of someone charging up, it's like, ah, we've got it. Like, go attack that person, right? Like, go fight them. Yeah. And so only yeah. like the best stuff was saved in that story. And so when you hear that story, you're like, wow, that stuff was incredible. Because it's yeah. all of the best stuff, all the best information from that I story see. told in the best way. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Right, Dylan, I think... We're going to have to close it up. I don't know how much memory Facebook can take from us, but <laughs> yeah. I can listen for, for hours. And I'm sure you've got lots more to share, but we could maybe do a, a take two, uh, which I'd love to do. So Absolutely. anyone that's been listening, thank, thanks for everyone that's come on live and, and maybe had to leave us and whoever's watching the replay. If you do have any questions for myself or Dylan, send them in the comments below and we'll try and get around to answer them in the comments or in a, a follow-up because um, there's there's lots we can share and you can pick a, pick at uh, Dylan's mind. <laughs> so this will be in Ben's Business Book Club and produced onto iTunes uh, and SoundCloud and everything else in audio form as well as video. So thanks for everyone who's come online. Thank you, Dylan, for sharing everything. You've done thanks exact- for having me. <laughs> you're, you practice what you preach by giving us so much and uh, it'll definitely come back to you. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, uh, new things I've learned today, so I'm sure other people listening in have learned a ton. <laughs> yeah, like I said, thanks for having me.